I value the movie opinions of both of these men, even though they are very different about how they arrive at their opinions, and they have very different opinions, and they rarely agree on much of anything when it comes to the movies because they experience film differently. Uh, Amin is still trying to get in the game here with Cinephobe on the movie front, but he does not have a segment here. The host of Nothing Personal, David Sampson, does, and Adnan Verk does as the host of Cinephile. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. I want to start today with best movie endings ever, okay? Top five best movie endings ever. Mike, why are you... Uh, Is this a spoiler warning? Because movie endings are kind of a big deal. Of course, there's a spoiler warning, but I'm going to guess, guys, just from your lists of top five best movie endings ever, how many of them are recent? Like, what is, for both of us, Samson, the most recent one on your list is about what year? Uh, at least 10 years old. Okay, add So there's no spoiler alert allowed. For me, a year is the maximum. Uh, Adnan, how about you? Uh, the most recent of your choices is about what year? 16 years, 2007. I'm with David. I think we're good in the spoilers. Play on. All right. Thank Ooh. you, uh, Mike, for being vigilant about uh, everybody except the people in the audience who really are going to get mad because they haven't seen these movies in the last 10 or 16 years and are still going to be furious. Uh, who are we going to start with? Let's start with David because his list is usually the most appalling. Uh, <laughs> n number five, David. Thelma and Louise. When you have a movie of two people holding hands and going off a cliff, you're thinking, wow, that is a partnership that I would love to be a part of, a connection that I would crave to have and have never had. <laughs> Adnan, God. Adnan, why I mean, are you as, shaking your head? As usual, Dan, it's just the, the, the schmaltz and sentiment of Samson comes out. It's a movie about female serial killers. And he's making it sound like it's, 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 he's, he's making it sound like it's beaches, for God's sake. It's, like it's Ben Midler and Barbara Hershey caressing. Just as one of them is about to die. No, they kill. And now they're going to go jump into a... They're going to go drive into a... Hey, you cannot make this up. Before this segment, I was training for something. And on my playlist is the entire soundtrack from Beaches. <laughs> and I just listened to... Otto Titzling at the end of my workout. I swear to you, you can't make it up. Well, listen, bottom line is this, David. You are the wind beneath my wings. We can agree on that, but I'm not down with Thelma and Louise at number five. Go ahead. Uh, Mike, I need some production help here just with Adnan and Samson in this regard. I believe, and it's not just the dog that's distracting them, I believe that <laughs> Tony and Jessica have no interest in what these people are talking about because they don't care about movies that are this old. I don't know what Beaches is. Is that a movie? Is it a show? What yeah, is it? I don't believe they care in any way about Thelma and Louise, and I don't know what the classics are, where we age out culturally on some of this stuff. The moment they said 16 years, we just lost 40% of the That work. one's like 40 yeah. years old, I think. I don't I, even know. I, okay, so number four, David. My personal favorite, War of the Roses. It's a good one. Yeah. Oh, if you've not heard of War of the Roses, it's a movie that I took my ex-wife to the night we got engaged. It's about a couple who gets divorced <laughs> so and ends up killing each other. <laughs> Wait a minute. Well that can't be true. Well played. That it's cannot totally be true. true. The night you got engaged, you went to see the most famous movie ever about divorce. Because I wanted it to be clear that I didn't want to end that way. Oh, of course. Uh, little did I know. Yeah. <laughs> That's an amazing <laughs> sentence. I proposed to my now ex-wife at, at or around War of the Roses. I like. I, I love the idea that David didn't know what the movie was about. I said, "Oh, roses! That's romantic." Uh, Kathleen oh, Turner. No, I did know what it was about. Yes. It was totally purposeful. <laughs> Kathleen Turner and Michael Douglas worked uh, together a couple of times, right? Romancing the yeah. Stone. Mm -hmm. What was your favorite on-screen pairing? Was it War, War of the Roses? Yes, with Jewel of the Nile second, yeah. Romancing the Stone third. What? They were a power couple. They were a power couple back in the day. Did you just break our wall because you're offended by Jewel of the Nile? Being Over Romancing the Stone? It's one of the worst. Jewel of the Nile is one of the worst sequels in movie history. It's awful. It's not even in the top ten, I mean. It's awful. Romancing the Stone was a good movie. Jewel of the Nile was just blah. Right. Was well put.
It's why you're not in the segment. Mm. Uh, number Boy, three, it's, it's why <laughs> there are movie experts and you're doing uh, cinephobe on bad movies. Well, that's I know bad movies, Dan. Jewel of the Nile is a bad movie. Number th- Listen, I, I, I'm with the meat on this. He is right that Jewel of the Nile is not good, but I got to back up Samson. War of the Roses, fantastic, and it does have a killer ending. I have no issues on that one. Chandelier, incredible. Number three, Samson. Number three is the end of The Departed, and I hate to put a Scorsese movie on this, but the end of The Departed, no. sorry, forgot the music, but we're short on time already. The end of The Departed, when you realize that someone is getting what is coming to them, and it happens with the medical school hospital boots on by Mark Wahlberg killing Matt Damon, that is a killer ending, more so than even War of the Roses. Okay, what? I've been on Cinefo, and Amin knows, because I defended The Departed, and then he mocked me with The Departed, and the best thing that Amin pointed out is the ending isn't great. Yeah. Now, the actual double crossing of the murders, I'm with you, David, but the last shot is so bad. brutal, and I'm so criticizing bad. this for a second. So movie. bad, the little rat. The last shot of a rat, Dan, it could not have been more on the nose, more obvious. It was a terrible visual shot from our greatest visual master, a, a genius in Scorsese. Departed at number three? No way. Samson, a rat uh, skittering across the screen because Matt Damon's a rat? Like, that was awful. <laughs> awful. It's his list, Dan. I mean. No, that's that's a good point. I saw that movie when I was, like, in sixth grade, and Jesus I did, Christ. like, the Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the screen meme because I, like, got what was going on, and that's a bad sign when, like, <laughs> fifth graders are like, I get the subtlety of this shot. <laughs> <laughs> I gone can't way believe you're allowed head. to see such a violent movie in elementary school. Okay. Number two. <laughs> Sorry, wait. Number okay. two. I will never forget, and I try to relive this ending. It's the ending of Castaway, where Tom Hanks looks and is trying to decide which direction his life is going to go. Will he follow the winged, uh, the golden <laughs> wings? Adnan, you say one word about the end of Castaway. Just one word. I liked it. It just either you haven't seen it. Or no, I've seen it. What it is to have a I life can't choice. believe I can't believe David went less subtle than the, the departed ending. Then, yeah. then Tom Hanks' <laughs> life at a literal crossroads. Yeah, it, it is so obvious. Right? Robert Zemeckis, they're just hitting over the head with a giant anvil. Like, look, this guy overcame all this strife. He talked to a volleyball. He yeah. lost Wilson, his best friend, who was a volleyball. But now he just sees a girl in a cowboy hat, and he says, you know what? Maybe life's going to work out okay. You know what? I, I survived it all. But you know what? This girl in the cowgirl hat, I feel pretty good And always life. beware of the girl in the cowboy hat. Your life will not be okay. I liked uh, it. Samson, your thoughts here? I have those wings tattooed on me. <laughs> wow. Wow. You really believe in this. Um, oh. uh, um, um, Adnan, Adnan. For all of you people, Dan, here's, here's the problem. You put this group of people together, and they're prone just to make fun of the list. But when you're watching the end of Castaway, how do you not reflect internally on what your life choices are and what you could be doing better, worse, or differently as the clock is running out? I hated the ending of Castaway. Yeah. It wasn't Great a happy movie, ending. Horrible ending. Mm-hmm. Uh, number one, David. <laughs> You're just shaking your Go head ahead. and laughing one. because everyone's can't powerful. be worse than Castaway. Uh, it can't be worse. My favorite. <clears throat> my favorite movie ending is a movie called Chances Are. Chances Are is a movie with Ryan O'Neill and Sybil Shepherd and Robert Downey Jr. and Mary Stuart Masterson. And it ends, it's a time travel movie sort of about rebirth, and it ends with a wedding. And it ends with someone being able to figure out what true love is and acknowledging that the life they have is the life they want, even though it's not what they expected. It's got one of the great movie soundtrack songs of all time by Sharon Peter Cetera called After All Chances Are. And uh, that movie I've watched the end of, no exaggeration, well over 200 times. <laughs> and then... Danny, stop me. I've never seen Chances Are. I've heard of it. I'm obviously aware of Ryan O'Neill's work, but I can't believe that's the number one movie ending of all time. Clearly, I've got work to do here. I won't see it 200 times. Maybe I'll see it once, and that will suffice. But, uh, it sounds uh, wow. like the movie David should have taken his wife to after he got engaged. <laughs> <laughs> or Castaway. Stu, do not put my ex-wife's name in your mouth. Yeah. Uh, Adnan, what does your Ooh. list lo- look like? Uh, let's begin with number five, please. Well, the, the better list is always, Dan. Number five is The Sixth Sense. 
totally predictable. I see dead people. I mean, you're not topping that ending. I mean, it literally started a phenomenon that entire summer. It put M. Night Shyamalan on the map. It put Bruce Wells back on the map. The shot of the wedding ring and the, the horror and look on Haley Joel Osment. David, the sixth sense, killer ending. And then I just feel like you Google best endings for critics to say, no. but we'll see what the rest of your list is. Number four. The Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> Did. Ultimate story of male <laughs> friendship, okay? Red was here. Get busy living or get busy dying. You're goddamn right. Morgan Freeman on the bus, a voice that belongs out of the Smithsonian. He sees Tim Robbins on the beach. The quintessential film about male friendship. You won't get a dry eye in the house when you're watching The Shawshank Redemption. Put it on the Number poll, three. please, Juju. Put it on the poll, please. Get busy living or get busy dying. You're goddamn right, yes or no. Number three. <laughs> Number three is There Will Be Blood. Oh, God. What an exciting I drink, list. I drink your milkshake. Yeah, yeah. I drink it up. Yes, it's good. Ah, <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis goes way, way, way over the top as he yeah, takes always. a bowling pin and beats the crap out of Paul Dano. It's one of the greatest, most memorable movie endings ever. There Will Be Blood, and there was a whole lot of blood. And this P.T. Anderson classic, one of the best movies in the last 20 years. We can pre-tape this segment, Dan. We really, none of us need to be here for Adnan's topic. Number two. Casablanca. <laughs> Google. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, soon for the rest of your life. What about us? We'll always have Paris. All right? So Here's silly. looking at you, kid. Here's looking at you, Samson. Come on. Casablanca, all five movie ending. Number one, and <laughs> number one is the usual suspects. Yeah. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's Kaiser Sosa. Yeah. You will not get a better ending than Kevin Spacey <laughs> figuring out his hand is okay, oh. lighting a cigarette, away we the go. The limp, the, the limp goes away. It's a good list, David. It's an indisputably good list. No last dance, huh? <laughs> <laughs> uh, for both of you guys, no Inception with the, the spinning top. Yeah, Inception would be yeah. close to my list. I'm putting together a list of Inception. worst movie endings ever, and like Leo DiCaprio what? has like three terrible Wait, endings. Wait, you, you didn't like Inception? I, here's the Inception ending that I like, that if it happened in 2007 with Linkin Park playing at the end of it, because <laughs> you, I've gone through so much with Inception. I It's a it's an almost an impossible movie to follow, and I've done it. I've done it, and I want an ending. Tell me what happens. What, oh, Don't you, leave it after all of that. After all that mental gymnastics that I'm doing, tell me what happens. You want, I could tell you what happens. Like honestly, what the what the last scene is. Michael Caine said any scene where he's in, that's reality for DiCaprio. If he's not in the scene, that means that's a dream. So the fact that he walks in with the kids, that indicates that actually happened. What I've done. Also, he wears a wedding band in the, in the dream yes. and doesn't wear one in real life. In real life, exactly. Uh, gentlemen, thank you. Appreciate the time. Uh, we'll do it again next week. Thanks, guys. An all-out brawl has ensued after that Samson Adnan segment because we got into it over Inception. And Christopher Nolan's one of my favorite filmmakers, and he's got a huge movie coming out in Oppenheimer. Mm. And I was making the point to Amin privately that I think Nolan has to show us something. Because Tenet stunk. It just stunk. There were a lot of problems with Tenet. Number one, it's the most confusing movie Nolan has ever made. Still don't get it. And it and that's saying a lot. lot. Saying a lot for Christopher Nolan. I didn't like I didn't think John David Washington was charismatic enough. I thought the high points of that movie was when Robert Pattinson was on screen. You alleged racism, mm -hmm. which was wholly unfair, mm -hmm. I felt, and I demand an apology. That was off air. Yeah. That, that was off air. But I, I will, the, the thing I'm saying to you is I don't think John David Washington is the reason why that movie wasn't well received. I think the movie, reason the movie was well received is because it was too convoluted a plot. I just didn't get I've watched it three times, and each time I get more and more confused. Maybe I'm just an idiot. Man, good on you for watching it three times. I saw it once. This was like height of pandemic. Dude, it was the first movie. I risked my life for this thing. It was the first movie. <laughs> uh, true story. It was the first movie where I said, because they opened it in theaters, I said, I think I might risk my life to go watch this movie. Because the trailers were so cool, and I'm like, okay, here we go. And then I just like a chicken out. I said, I can't do this. It came out on HBO Max. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. And I watched it. And I was like, all right. 
Uh, what? I think what? I think Nolan low key What's needs this one to work. I like Dunkirk, but Jeremy was telling me he didn't like Dunkirk. I didn't even see Tenant because Dunkirk to me was one of the most boring movies I've ever seen in my what? life. What? <laughs> Truly one of the most boring Such movies. A big I did movie. not. Hold on. I did tick, not tick, care tick, about tick, a tick, single tick. character. So not one. You didn't care about the characters in Dunkirk. Couldn't Styles find myself here. That's the only reason I cared about him was because he was actually Harry Styles. So Jeremy, Jeremy, my brother. You are not alone. I thought Dunkirk visually was stunning. He shot in right. 70 millimeter. It is visual. Like the act of filmmaking, Correct. He was. it was amazing. As a story, there is no story. Thank you. There is no story. In Dunkirk? Dunkirk is boring. There is no it's story? Boring. No story. It's They're boring. trying to survive a war. Yeah. Seen, seen it. Seen it already. Not from the English side. I mean, Billy, fair? you've seen it from the American side. It's a side. different side. I mean, Mike's right. Billy, did Never you have any an thoughts? <laughs> you were making faces. My body just reacts when people talk about like what kind of camera was used to film it and how it was right. visually stunning. I'm just like, oh, I know who cares. Here and we that's go. why it was like boring. this thing. Again. Everybody's a cinematographer Shoot here. Movie. Again. But, exactly right. <laughs> you know what? I saw Operation Fortune. Incredible movie. Jason Statham, Aubrey Plaza, Hugh Grant, <laughs> oh, she's having a moment. Josh Hartnett. Huh. I've been Josh Hartnett. Yeah, I've been waiting three years to watch this movie. I saw it in 2020 it was coming out, and then something happened, the pandemic, and then it's like, where do we release? To Wait. release it here, to release it there. Then it was in theaters for like two weeks, and I didn't go in those two weeks. I was really upset with my wife. That was a major sticking point in our relationship, one that we still are overcoming. But it was available to stream recently, so I paid the five ninety nine and watched it. God, what a movie. Guy Ritchie, ever heard of him? Josh Hartnett's alive and acting? Yeah, he's in that movie. I described him earlier because I forgot his name. As one of those pretty boys. I said, like, oh, it has Statham, Aubrey Plaza, Hugh Grant, and one of those pretty boys. And then Coogs made fun of me. He's like, if it was 2002. And I'm like, well, yeah, yeah. but still one of those pretty boys. You, you don't care about how a movie is filmed? Not at all. Because nope. I do think that there's something to shot with IMAX cameras. Yeah. The one that I never got, and I think Adam made the point, we were talking about Hateful Eight, which is, I think, wide gulf. Easily Quentin Tarantino's worst movie. You guys because are out he of terrible your take. He terrible went out of, out of his way. Get out terrible of villain. It was just awful. And terrible just, villain? Yeah. Terrible villain. Terrible villain. But he went out of his way to advertise you need to see this on 35 millimeter. And I'm gonna see Oppenheimer on 35 millimeter film because that's how the director intended. What does that mean? And then you see Barbie. And you can't yeah, I'm definitely gonna do Barbenheimer on the same day. We'll get to that in a moment. But you can't do you have to see this the way that I shot it and then do everything in one room. It's dumb. It's dumb. Did At least with Oppenheimer, shots? Christopher Nolan commissioned oh, an actual weapon of mass destruction. The Old West. It was bad. S oh, Allow me to say this again children. for those oh. in the back. Christopher Nolan commissioned an actual weapon of mass destruction. Because it was cheaper than doing the SFX. WMD. Yeah. yeah. He, he, he blows stuff up yeah. in 35 millimeters. So I'm going to do that. And then afterwards, a little palate cleanse with Barbie. Put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Levitard Show. Does Christopher Nolan need to show you something after Tenet? He's on a – Dan, he's <laughs> he on a cold streak. Okay, give us – give us. He's, on, on, a he's on a cold streak. Give us the streak. So he comes out the gate with Memento, Insomnia, Batman Begins, Prestige, Dark Knight, uh, Dark Knight Inception, and then Dark Knight Rises. Dark Knight. Yeah. Bangers. A lot of bangers oh, in that list. Yo, Interstellar, stunning, oh. but not great. Uh, it, it, look. I'm going to say this. People said Interstellar was amazing. It took me a long time to watch it. When I finally watched it, I said, it's good. How'd you watch it? I One thought millimeter. it was good. Uh, <laughs> Interstellar is just watch it at home. Okay. okay. Billy, I think, I think when it comes to talking about what some what film something is shot in or how something is shot, like you, pro most people probably don't care about it, but you do notice that it looks different without maybe understanding why. Like the film, yeah. things shot on film look different, and you might not be able to articulate like what it is or why, but – you feel different yes. watching it. It's it just looks different. Absolutely. I like art direction. I like cinematography. I think these things are important. So he went Interstellar, then he went Dunkirk, and then he went Tenet. That's a, that's a cold oh, streak for Christopher okay, Nolan. Okay, and, and compared to those, those first are giant movies. Incidentally, like I I understand the expectations that you have for Christopher Nolan, but what he is doing when you say he's getting an actual weapon of mass destruction, he is making these epic. He is trying to attacking space and whatnot to make the biggest movies ever made. I mean, the most ambitious thing is that he's taking all the IMAX screens away from Tom Cruise. And Tom Dude, Cruise is that's a crazy story. He wants him back. There's a Cold War There's going on. There's a movie on there between Christopher Nolan. Yes, absolutely. Yes. yes. There's a war going on between Tom Cruise and Christopher Nolan. 
because there are only a handful of IMAX screens really compared to regular movie theaters, and they're both fighting for the real estate for who gets to control the IMAX. So if I have it right, Mission Impossible Part 7, Part 1 mm -hmm. drops a couple of weeks before Barbenheimer weekend. July 17th. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it drops one week before Barbenheimer, and they're just giving Mission Impossible uh, Part 7, Part 1 the screens for that opening weekend. And Tom Cruise, who saved the movie industry as we know it, yeah. is like, no, 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 no. Oppenheimer, I don't care if you commissioned uh, a weapon of mass destruction. I jump off a goddamn mountain on a motorcycle, and I did myself. Eight times. Eight times he did that take. By the way, tickets on sale right now. I reserve my seats for Mission Possible Part 7, Part 1. We were talking about Schwarzenegger and Stallone yesterday, and I was a conversation point wow. that we... Exactly. That we did not go down is who's the next young up and coming action star. It's not just that they're all over 50, it's that Tom Cruise is the young one at 60. If we're doing Schwarzenegger, Stallone, and Liam Neeson, I saw him in memory last night. I'm like, what? really, he's still doing memory this. Memory file. He's, he's still doing this where he's. But Tom Cruise is the young action star. But who? No, Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> yeah. Need I remind you, Tyler really? Rake lives. Yeah. Okay, oh, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of doing non, uh, non Marvel. No, but he uh, does. You Universe. Extraction. No, but extraction. Extraction. I told you Tyler Rake lives. He's pushing 40, too, Hemsworth. <laughs> yeah, but he does. He he's worried about his future, uh, his own mortality, because they found like a gene that oh, he no. thinks he might start deteriorating, a la Bruce Willis. So enjoy Chris Hemsworth while we have him. Is Keanu Reeves also over 50? That's old? Okay. Good news. Mission Impossible is not July 17th. It's actually July 12th. Still upset Ooh. about it, though, because he wants I IMAX screens as Up long as he had them for... going to get all the IMAX coverage. It's <sighs> tough. Chris Pratt. Yeah, but he's in that he's, like uh, franchise yeah. territory. No, but he's, he does a little he, stuff. He's he was good in Terminal List. Pseudo canceled also. Can I give you... Chris like, Pratt is canceled? A lot of people no. don't like pseudo. Chris Pratt. Why not? Pseudo. His involvement with like some church. I don't. I need. Oh, I need to Google. Oh, he boy. didn't mention Anna Ferris by name. If you're pseudo canceled, are you actually canceled? No, he's not canceled. No one's really. What canceled. is pseudo canceled? No one. They don't like him. I mean, Super Mario Brothers is like the biggest movie of the year. If you tweet his name, people will have strong opinions. So. Tony Ja. Can I give you an IMAX hack? Like, just sit in the first row of a regular movie theater, and it's the same thing as IMAX. <laughs> you don't have to find a special IMAX theater. Just sit in, like, the second or third row, and that's Straight the Straight on the experience. neck, though, it, you know? Well, that's what IMAX yeah, is. Yeah, always looking up. Oh, my God. Yeah. One time I went to an IMAX at Sunset Place, and I was e actually it was a science museum in Fort Lauderdale, and I had a bucket of fries back when that was a thing that McDonald's did. You remember that? A bucket of fries. And then I was watching, like, a roller coaster IMAX. It was a science museum, so it wasn't for movies. Oh, I was so sick. I threw up the entire bucket of fries. <laughs> it's terrible. The first seat in the theater, put it on the poll, please, Juju, at Levitard Show, is the first seat in the theater a terrible experience in the movie theater. Taryn Edgerton? Uh, let's do something here with uh, no very uh, short Mike Ryan based no on the terrible. Tom Cruise is not short. He yeah. wears what are you lips? talking Cruise about? Five feet he tall. Wears... No, Tom Cruise is seven feet tall. Okay. It's funny to see the tricks that they do with the short action stars where like they do like the zoomed out shots. So like when Vin Diesel's yeah. doing something with John Cena, and you're like, why are Vin Diesel's knees where John Cena's waist is? That's not right. <laughs> Because of the list that David Sampson put together, I'm stunned, just legitimately stunned, that Sampson's number one movie ending of all time is something that Adnan has never seen. And it felt like he hadn't heard of it either. I'd which, only heard of the Peter Cetera song. I didn't know that was from a movie. What you said was a banger. It was an absolute banger. Cetera's got it's some. Peter Cetera. <laughs> uh, Mike Ryan. No miracle on ice for either of them, huh? Mike Ryan has a list of the top five movie, or the worst. The worst top movie five endings. worst movie endings of all time. Number five. All right. I had to pick, uh, I mean, Leo's got so many of these. So Leo's debut on this countdown is Shutter Island at number five. Oh, Horrible. When he realizes he's the one that was in the insane asylum the whole time. Spoiler alert. Uh, it's great. an awful movie. Number Awful four, movie. La La Land. <laughs> Jess, any thoughts on La La Land? Never watched it. Oh, love it. But the ending. That made me cry. Yeah, me too. So good. Cultural appropriation. So good. Number three. <laughs> no Country for Old Men. Really? <laughs> what? What's your... Did Tommy Lee Jones just droning, muttering, mumbling in a fade to black? Come on. It's what it he was does. Awful. It's called acting. <laughs> it was an awful ending. That movie was great. They should have just cut that scene out. Number two. Titanic. Right. Move 
off the door. There's space for Jack. We all know this. That. Is that a criticism of the ending or the actions of the characters? There is space for Jack. He didn't have to I'm die. I'm not disagreeing with you. Number one. Marley and me. Don't kill a dog. Loved it. Don't kill a dog, ever. Loved it. 